Today on Your Money, Your Wealth, are you screwing up your backdoor Roth IRA conversion? Joan Big Al will help figure it out. Plus, confirming taxation on a mega backdoor Roth conversion, Roth contribution limits and selling investments, and how the Medicaid spend-down rules affect your Roth IRA. We have yet more discussion on Vanguard's VTSAX and dividend yield, and the fellows will look at various options for saving and investing for minor children and grandchildren. But first, Joan Big Al takes a burning confession about Roth conversions. Click Ask Joe and Big Al in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com to send in your money questions. And don't forget to tell us all the irrelevant stuff, like what you drive and whether your cat or dog listens to YMYW with you. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. we got John from Vancouver, USA. I didn't know there was uh, Vancouver in the United States of America. Vancouver, Washington. I thought that. Oh, really? I suppose. Yeah. That's As opposed to Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I was thinking Canada. <laughs> yeah. That's why he specified. Well, I understand. So, so, we, so we'd know. Um, fellas, we, my terrier Finnick, and I enjoy your podcast during our evening walks. All right. Very cool. Uh, in Vancouver, it's probably getting chilly in Vancouver right now. Oh, yeah. Chilly, but cooling down. Probably so. Uh, good job to all three of you. Question. In year 2000, I converted a small non-deductible IRA to a Roth. In every year since, I've either contributed directly to the Roth with earned wages or converted amounts from a rollover IRA to the Roth. My burning question for you stems from a burning confession. A lot of burning going on there, John. Oh, yeah, right? Yeah. I've never filled out a Form 8606. Uh-oh. Alan, can you believe it? <laughs> I mean, the I would, I would say most people don't know what that form is. And I, I'd say a lot of tax preparers don't even know what that form is. So don't feel bad, John. Uh, he can't sleep. <laughs> I mean, the guy, it's That's why he had to write in, right? I, I, he's like, I guarantee. Yeah, he's, he's actually I, from Canada. Um, I bet he, <laughs> he's trying to get the, the feds off his back by saying he, he lives in the USA. I, I bet he probably, he, he almost hit send on this email a hundred times, but he was afraid he'd be caught. So he finally chanced uh, it. I, I, you, usually, hey, I have a friend um, <laughs> that has never filed at 8606. Yeah, right. Uh, so my question is, how deep is the water on my failure to submit Form 8606? In the early days of TurboTax, in Roth conversion, it seemed the software was suspect and I had to deal with conversions manually. Uh, it consequently got me to practice of not using TurboTax for treatment of conversion, and hence no Form 8606 was filed. I'm confident I paid all tax due on the conversion, but I do have a concern about clearing up necessary tax forms. How would you handle this? Okay, well, a couple of things. So it seems to me, Al, reading this email is that he did a non-deductible IRA contribution in the year 2000 and converted that non-deductible IRA to a Roth IRA. Right. The reason why 8606 is important in that case is because the 8606 form uh, shows basis. It shows, all right, if I made a non-deductible IRA contribution um, of $6,000, you want to file that form so you're not double taxed because it's an after-tax contribution. So when you take the $6,000 back out, it will not be taxed again. Um, however, the money comes out pro rata. It seems as John made the non-deductible IRA contribution and then converted it directly into the Roth. As long as he didn't have any other IRAs, he's fine in the fact that he he did what is called a backdoor Roth IRA contribution, right? Non-deductible IRA, then immediately converted it to a Roth. So the 8606 form shows, hey, I have basis, I converted it, but then he's using TurboTax, so he probably, you know, kind of jimmied it where, because I've had clients that are like, "I, I don't know how to do this. Can we just, you know, figure out a way to, to, to rig the system so it doesn't show up anywhere because they don't understand what a non-deductible IRA conversion is. So I, right. I, I feel John's pain there with, with TurboTax. 
Yeah, I, I agree too, because in TurboTax, you have to answer a bunch of questions and it's frustrating for professionals even to try to figure out, okay, how do I answer this? I know what I want the result to be, but I don't know what, how to answer this question. So here, here's a couple of things. 8606 is, that's right, it's for non-deductible IRAs to keep track of tax basis. It's also used for Roth conversions on page two. Um, if you didn't file the form, I would not lose any sleep whatsoever, particularly if you think you did it right. However, on a go forward basis, just start doing it. There's nothing you have to do to go back and fix anything. Just start doing it right on a go forward basis. The IRS does not have the resources to track people's, people's missing 8606. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, I'm surprised that he wasn't audited back in then 2000 or, or you know, in like 2001 or 2002 um, yeah. to, to show Hey, because that happened to me every single time that I did it, uh, uh, that I do a non-deductible IRA contribution, it will show $6,000, right? As a distribution that's non-taxable, then they're, Hey, well, what happened here? Do you owe tax on this? And then it's like, you know, you talk to the CPA, Hey, did you file the 8606 form correct? Uh, because it'll flag, because if you do it on your tax return correctly, it will show a distribution from the IRA. Uh, but then the 8606 form washes it out, so it shows not taxable. So maybe he just ignored it. Maybe he just converted it and didn't even put it on it because he knew he didn't owe any taxes anyway. So, um, but yeah, I agree with you, Al. I, I would definitely ignore it. He he knows what an 8606. He's probably freaking out. That we got one page missing in these tax forms from 10 years and 20 years ago. What I mean. Yeah, they're, uh, they're after you. Well, first of all, the IRS can only audit you for three years after you file. So that's one thing. So In the year uh, 1978. <laughs> now, I took if, an extra $6 uh, deduction. If, I, I suppose if, they can, if the IRS could prove fraud, there is no statute of limitations. But not filing 8606 is not fraud. I wouldn't worry too much about it. All right, just, do it right, just do it right going forward. All right. Well, hopefully you can sleep better at night. Go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com if you've got a question like Mike did from Washington, D.C. Hi there. I'm 32 years old. Paid off all my student loans, around eighty dollars to $90,000, and have just over $300,000 in overall liquid and retirement savings. Killing the game, Mike. 32, Al. He's saved $300,000 and paid off another $100,000. That's four hundred k. Yeah, uh, that is amazing, Mike. That's, uh, that's what, you know, that's what happens when you listen to your money or wealth. I mean, stuff like that just happens to people. I'm contributing about 13 to 14% of my 401k Roth 401k through work. I have a Roth IRA account in the last few years. I've contributed the maximum amount of $6,000, but when I put the information during my taxes, they asked me to withdraw that amount because I made over the limit of $183,000. I am making this contribution through a backdoor conversion. So I thought I was doing this correct. What am I doing wrong? What steps do I need to do for this to work? Also, do you recommend not contributing to a Roth IRA and just my total percent to the Roth 401k? Any help would be greatly appreciated. Um, all right. So Mike makes over $183,000. So he's 32. So... Yeah, but he's doing a backdoor Roth IRA. That, um, so he's doing a non-deductible IRA, then converting it. And he's probably using TurboTax. So we kind of answered this question a little bit earlier. Um, I think he's doing everything correct, but he needs to file the dreaded 8606 form and figure out how to do it on his taxes appropriately. Yeah, or just contribute to your Roth 401k. Much simpler. You get the same impact, right? That's what I would do. Um. Yeah, it, it, it and, makes and, no difference. A Roth, I mean, here's the difference between a Roth IRA and a Roth 401k. Um, a Roth 401k, the biggest difference is that if you have to take a required distribution at age 72 out of a Roth 401k, Mike is 32. It makes no difference. He's going to move the money out of that plan and put it into a Roth IRA to avoid that anyway. Uh, if he likes the investments accounts inside his 401k, then by all means, do the Roth 401k, right? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's simpler. It's simpler. If, if you have extra money, though, I mean, if you're not maxing out, I mean, let's say you are maxing out and you still want to put more money into the Roth, then 
then go for it. But if your income, I think the limits this year are what, 193 to 203, something like that, I yes. believe for the phase out, give or take. Um, if your income's above that, you've got to do backdoor Roth, which, which means that you shouldn't have any other IRAs. If you do, it blows this whole thing up. But assuming you have no other IRAs, you can continue to do the backdoor Roth at any income level. So that would be a way to do that over and above your 401k. So, yeah, it sounds to me that he's got everything in a Roth 401k, and then he's got the Roth IRA account, doesn't have any other IRAs. You make the $6,000, a non-deductible IRA contribution, you convert it directly into the Roth IRA. Um, what, what's blowing him up is just how it's reported on his taxes. It sounds like he might be doing his taxes on his, on his own. Um, you just have to file the 8606 form, um, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, but you're doing everything okay, Mike. Congratulations, actually. Um, you're, you're, you're doing a phenomenal job. All right, Deborah from California. Uh, when doing a mega Roth, in later year, doing you get hit when taking <laughs> distribution on tax for <laughs> earnings growth that it makes. <sighs> People, you gotta you gotta re you gotta read what you write us. <laughs> when doing a mega Roth, um, in later year, doing <laughs> you get hit when taking a distribution on tax for earnings growth that it makes. I heard that normal Ruth does not, but the backdoor Ruth does. Oh my. Okay. Um, oh. So Roth wow. and Ruth are synonymous. Alan is the color of his shirt, which is kind of purple. Oh. He was laughing so hard. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good one. I like it. <laughs> Oh. I heard that the normal Ruth does not, <laughs> but the backdoor Roth does. Is that in reference to your mom? Maybe? Yes, my mom is Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, well, right, let so, me, yeah. So, when you do a mega backdoor Roth, you're putting after tax money in your 401k. You're allowed to put that or convert that to the Roth IRA and pay no tax. But to the extent there's any growth on that amount, you do have to pay tax on that part. I think that's what she's talking about. Uh, but, if, if it's as long as it's in a Roth IRA and it qualifies for a tax free distribution, you're fine. So, um, right. Well, if it's, a, if it's after tax money, right. And you put that in any growth that you put into the Roth, you got to pay tax on that. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. There you have it. Uh, Rudy writes in, um, good morning. Question Roth IRA limit is $6,000 per year. Can I sell my investment at, a profit and what do i do with the profits what's <laughs> there you go al that's your question i was i read that i was hoping you would understand it when you read it i, I don't know don't people write it. us the, the weirdest things yeah good morning question <laughs> okay um i don't know what to what, what, what should we just get rudy i don't understand the question here well let me let me take a stab at it yeah <laughs> he's so, got a uh, IRA, sixty thousand. can i sell my investment at a profit and what do i do with the profits I don't know so what the hell he's it, talking about. Well, if he's talking about he's got he's got profits in his stocks and he wants to sell the stocks to contribute to a Roth, if that's what he's saying, you pay taxes on the profits, capital gains, if you've held them for more than a year, and you take that net amount and you put that into a Roth IRA up to six thousand dollars. If that's what you're talking about, great. Or maybe he's talking about uh, gains in a Roth. You don't pay any taxes in a Roth. It's tax-free forever. That's the reason why you get the money in there in the first place. You can buy and sell within the Roth, and then you don't pay taxes. So there's two angles there, and unless you can think of a third one. Oh, got it. I understand. <laughs> uh, we got DJP. Okay. I've had my free assessment. However, you keep talking about Roth conversions. We were told not to convert, but keep adding money to our 401k. I'm 63 years old, plan to work until 70. I have $100,000 in my 401k. My employer stopped matched due to COVID. I would like to confirm that I have received the correct advice. Um, well, let's see, you got $100,000, 401k, you're 63, you're going to work another seven years. Yeah, I don't, th th there's not a lot of money to convert. And so when you, depending on how much money that they want to pull out, um, you're probably going to continue in the lowest tax bracket. So yeah, I'm thinking the the hundred thousand in the four hundred one k, and 
maybe in seven years, it's 200,000 with contributions. Let's just throw out that number. And then we would say your RMD at age 72 is going to be about $8,000. It's not going to blow you up in a high tax bracket. Maybe you're in a higher tax bracket now than you will be in retirement. So it didn't make a lot of sense. But we don't, you know, based upon this question, we don't really have enough information. Um, that, that might be, Joe, that might be why you wouldn't do a Roth conversion if, is if you're in a higher bracket now and you're going to be in a much lower bracket in retirement, take the tax deduction. And if, you don't, if you're not going to have a big required minimum distribution. As DJP points out, Joe and Big Al talk about Roth conversions all the time because a conversion can potentially save you tens of thousands of dollars in taxes. But the fact is, unless you take your entire financial picture into account, it's hard to know for sure if a Roth conversion is the right move for you. Luckily, a certified financial planner professional from Joe and Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors can help guide you, and they'll do it for free. Schedule your free financial assessment video call ASAP because the calendar is already getting booked up solid as we approach the end of the year. And no matter where you are in the country, Joe and Big Al's team can help. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Then click the get an assessment button to schedule yours. Uh, we got Chris Brighton from Austin, Texas. Hi again, Andy. So this is just a personal email to Andy, I guess. <laughs> they know that to get to you guys, they got to come through me. Got it. Even though we have a button on our website that says Ask Joe in Big Al on the air. This is more direct. Got it. I'm prefixing my email below because you guys answered the question of mine back in episode 266. So we're not strangers. Oh, yep. I'm YMYW binging. Socially savvy Chris that hangs out at the food trucks. He's socially savvy, all right? Before they started closing due to COVID in Austin, uh, talking to all of the women. So what did I, was I That's the story you women? came up with about him. <laughs> yeah, like, he's probably doing it. <laughs> My wife got a kick out of that. Yeah, I bet she did, Chris. You were busted. Uh, <laughs> So figured this time I'd reveal more of my financial self. Thank you again, Andy, Joe, and Big Al for making a tough subject fun to learn. Now you can go to my notebook. All right. So, hi, Andy. I listened or watch you guys and think I've almost been on all of your YMYW shows. You produce an awesome show. Um, so he's kissing ass. First two paragraphs is just all Andy. We should just delete that and just give me the meat, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted for next time. Got it. Um, I'm kidding, Chris. I love hearing about your life. Um, th those other two guys aren't bad either. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, been so beneficial to my understanding where we might stand financially or should be taking action. Let me start by saying this isn't totally about me. We're married and live in Austin, Texas. I'm 64. My wife is over 70, and she's already retired drawing Social Security. I'm retiring at 66 in four months or sooner if they get tired of me. Uh, but that's, they'll be okay uh, because I've already attempted to retire at age 62 to pursue my passion of a pastry chef. Uh, then someone threw a job in my face I couldn't refuse, so here I am. Using it to pay for Roth conversions and petting our retirement. All right. So he doesn't plan on drawing Social Security until 67 or 70. Uh, depending on how we're managing our funds and our health. As mentioned before, I've been Roth converting for two years now at about $100,000 $100, a shot. I have money in a pre-tax account, two Roth accounts, one stock, one SDIRA Roth for CRE. Um, can you come up with that one, Big Al? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we have one joint account which is an after-tax uh, stock account. We've accumulated approximately $2.4 million, not including our home that's paid off. We have no outstanding loans. Is there anything else you could suggest we do to fine-tune our retirement route? I'd be honored to hear it. So I think he, he's doing quite well, right? So he, he retired at 62. He wants to be a pastry chef. He's going to draw his Social Security 67 to 70. Maybe, you know, he's like, I'm going to retire at full retirement age, maybe sooner, depending on if someone kind of, you know, it makes me upset. I'm just going to go put on my little hat and apron and, and make some cookies. Uh, I like it. 
so he's using the cash that he's getting to convert. So he's doing $100,000 Roth IRA conversions each year for the last two years. Uh, he's got $2.5 million. He's got a brokerage account. So he's trying to get some tax diversification. Uh, probably doesn't spend a lot. And then hangs out at the, the food trucks, you know, pitching his cookie and, and cupcake ideas, right? He's going to get a food truck in Austin called Chris's Cookies and and more. And more. Yeah, they, I like it. <laughs> I'll think of a better name off the cuff there. But um, as I stated, this isn't about me. My question has to do with Medicaid and Roth IRAs. A friend of mine's father was hospitalized and reached the Medicaid point. They were told that they were lucky that they didn't have a Roth IRA or they would have to use that before Medicaid would cover them. Uh, what's that all about? He found this article below that I included for your review. I'm sending this to you because you strongly believe in Roth conversions and so do I. But until this, I couldn't see a downside to Rothing out at least to a point where there's enough to cover using pre-tax RMDs to stay in low tax brackets. I want you guys to analyze on the subject, though it may not fall in your areas of expertise. That would be beneficial to your listeners. So, Al, did you, um, did you read the article? I did. Uh, and he's right. The article basically says that an IRA doesn't count for most states for Medicare. You know, with, with Medicare, Medicaid, to get to a nursing home, you have to go through all your assets. An IRA doesn't count because it's in payout status, whereas a Roth IRA does not have an RMD. And it could be you might have to bleed it all out. We're in California, Alan, so we call it Medi-Cal. Uh, but he's in Austin, Texas, so Medicaid. And, and basically... For anyone to get onto Medicaid or Medi-Cal, you need to be destitute. You need to be broke, just about. Um, so there's something that's called a Medi-Cal spend down. <clears throat> and there's a ways that you can avoid paying for care with your own assets. Uh, because there's, a, there's an asset uh, requirement. And then there's a, I mean, there's a, they look at your assets and then they also look at your income. And so if you have a lot of assets, they're like, well, no, you have enough assets to pay for your care. So you're going to pay for your care until you're flat broke. And if you're flat broke, then the government is going to take over and we will help pay for your care. It might not be as fancy of care. You might have to go to maybe a different facility or whatever. Um, but that is a benefit by being a U.S. citizen is that we do have health care. Uh, for elderly that might not have the resources to pay for it. So far, so good? Yep, you're right on track, Jam. Okay. And then Chris is saying, hey, man, my, my, my buddy's dad, they were saying, man, I'm glad he didn't have a Roth IRA because he would have to spend his own assets to pay for his own care. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so what the article So there's ways you can get around that is by, you know, doing – some gifting, turning your assets into income, and certain, I guess, strategies that are kind of on the edge of almost kind of illegal. Yeah, and, and that's right. And, the, and what this article, this is written by Ed Slot's group, which is actually probably the foremost authority on IRAs. So we tend to trust what they have to say. And that is true. To get on to, to, to Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California, you've got to spend down your assets. And, and so what the article says is if you have a Roth IRA, you're going to have to spend it down. If you have an IRA, you don't necessarily have to spend it down because it's a payout asset. There's a required minimum distribution. So that may be true. My experience, though, Joe, is you don't really want to go on a Medicaid facility or Medi-Cal facility if you can help it. And so it's not that they're horrible, but, but if you go to a facility that you're paying for, it will be much nicer. Uh, well, yeah, because you might get your own room versus a shared right. room. I, I mean, yes. there's really nice facilities here in Southern California. I, and, and so I don't want anyone to email um, Big Al and yell at, well, maybe I do. Um, <laughs> because in, in, in some cases, you can't really tell the difference of a Medi-Cal um, facility than an, a, a standard facility. Um, well, I, 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 so I just... I just go from experience sure. with my mother-in-law and we found a decent one because she had run out of money for her assets, but it was not near what she was experiencing had before of course. when, when she was on a long-term care policy. And um, 
it, yeah, shared room <laughs> it wasn't near the facility. So that's all I'm saying is, is if you can pay for it, if you have the resources to pay for it yourself, you, you probably will, or, or at least you'll be tempted to. So anyway, but you're also right, Joe. There, there are strategies to do asset transfers that typically you have to do it, is it what, seven years before? Otherwise, Five, there's a cloud or, back or something yeah. like that. Right. Yeah. You know, because then, or, or they annuitize their overall assets to create income. And then those assets then go into like an irrevocable, that income could feed um, another asset in an irrevocable trust that they don't have control over. Then that can get passed to the kids. I mean, there's all sorts of different strat. I mean, there's, people that specialize in avoiding, you know, the, the Medi-Cal spend down by preserving your assets. So you don't give it to the state, but um, you know, I guess it's what's your goals and what you're trying to accomplish. But yeah, if you do have the assets, um, you know, you pay for your care, so be it if you need it. Um, but if you want to look at different strategies to protect your Roth, th there are certain strategies that you can potentially do. We got Greg. He writes in, um, he, he gave us an attachment out of a rough draft of a financial plan, I think. Um, but I don't think I have that in front of me and I don't think we need it. Yeah, but if I think you do want to send us your financial plan, <laughs> it's, it'd take up two hours for us to go through line by line. Yeah, uh, it's, it probably doesn't make a... It probably doesn't make for a good, good podcast, but I'll just summarize the uh, little financial plan was they're spending about $3,000 a month uh, and it sounds like they've got some extra money, want to know how to invest it. So that's yeah. kind of the extent of that one pager. So uh, he writes in, uh, what, what, what do we got here? Uh, we're both going to retire at age 62 and eight years and seeking help on investing. Uh, my social security is going to be $1,200 a month at 62. My wife doesn't know hers. We will be debt free and RVing full time. What do you think, Al? Do you want to RV in full time? Uh, no, I don't. I, I, I think I'd do it for a week or two. All right. Our monthly expenses now is just under 3000 bucks. Beginning in March 2021, I'll free up $52.65 a week and my wife uh, 500 bi biweekly. Should I have this put into my company retirement plan or use outside company to invest? I'm sending a rough draft of what our finances after binge watching on YouTube all day Saturday and Sunday morning. Uh, you in Jazz Wealth. So a little promo there to Jazz Wealth. I don't know yeah, what, don't, what Jazz Wealth is. You know what Jazz Wealth either. is? No. I do. Yeah. He, do? He's he's a he's a financial planner and he's super popular. He's what what what, what so he's looking to save a five hundred and fifty two dollars. So yeah. what should he put in his four hundred one k plan or should he contribute outside? Yeah, well, generally you would use the 401k plan for a couple of reasons. One is it's easy, out of sight, out of mind. You know you're going to do it. Uh, typically a company does a match, you know, so you want to get that. Sometimes your company has a Roth option, which is can be a great way to go. So I think that's usually where you start. And, but I, I don't know when their little financial plan here just is expenses. It doesn't really say what they already have in savings. So I, I don't really have enough information. Well, all right. so if his social security is going to be twelve hundred bucks, um, at sixty two, so it's going to be what seventeen, eighteen hundred at full retirement age. So yeah, I'm guessing he's right. probably in the twelve percent tax bracket. I would probably it look at Roth IRAs um, for the money first, um, and then and then go to, to something else because he's in a fairly low tax bracket. Even though he'll probably be in a low tax bracket in retirement because uh, he's just going to spend just under three thousand bucks. So. Yeah, yeah, I think still, the, easiest, the, the easiest way to do is your 401k plan. Just jam as much as you can in there. And then, um, and then if they have a Roth option, maybe split it up. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if they have a match, you certainly want to make sure you take advantage of that. And then if they don't have a Roth option, maybe you stop at the match and go fill up your Roth. And then you come back to the 401k, maybe something like that. Get ready because class is once again in session. You may know that for years, Joe Anderson CFP has taught retirement classes in person at colleges and universities across Southern California. But now you can take this two-day retirement course online from anywhere. Learn how to build wealth and align your money with your values to accomplish your goals in life. Find out how to determine how much money you need to retire, how to properly convert your IRAs to Roth, how to transfer the risk of financial loss 
before or during retirement, and much more. It doesn't matter if you plan to retire in 20 years or if you've just recently retired. The knowledge you take away from this class can provide financial rewards throughout your lifetime. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. View the class schedule and sign up. Space is limited, so register for these two-day retirement classes now. Uh, Bruce from Joy Z uh, emails us once again. This show is just not a show without Bruce from Joy Z. I think he's yeah. He's he's a regular. Yeah, he's. I love all of our regulars. They're great. He's the fourth, um, you know, leg of the stool. Um, hello, Joe. And then he's got a bunch of lines here because he put me really at top billing. I appreciate that, Bruce. <laughs> and Alan, Andy. He gives you a lot of credit, Joe. And yes, then. He does. Then uh, Andy and I are kind of second billing, which is fine. Very much so. That's what Joe thinks we deserve anyway. Exactly. <laughs> um, thanks for the uh, elaborate explanation. Um, so I, apparently last week, Joe, we answered some. And the week before that and the week before that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think I'm still at a loss regarding the dividend in yield. Uh, focusing on, say, BTSAX. So that's the what Vanguard Total U.S. Stock Market Fund would yield 1.74%. Say it's $100 per share. I think I'm able to sort of replicate the double every 10 years by by multiplying the share to 1.0174 every quarter for 10 years. Was I somewhat right? No, not even close, but um, we'll continue. Then you mentioned that paying a dividend actually decreases the price of the share price. In a vacuum, does it mean that the price can just go close to zero for paying out the dividends? Ha, huh, I'm so confused. Okay, so he's talking about a total U.S. stock market index fund that has a dividend yield. And the dividend yield is based on the dividends of the stocks that you receive. So the, the total return of, of, of an investment right? It's growth plus the income equals your total return, right? Um, when you're buying a total U.S. stock market fund, you're buying every company basically that's listed on the exchange. Some of them create dividends. Some of them do not issue a dividend. So they're just basically looking at the dividend yield of the particular fund of 1.74. That's not saying that, that that's the yield per quarter because if you multiply that by four, that's 7%. And he's saying, hey, I'm going to get 7%. Over 10 years, I'm going to double my money. Don't look at it that way. The yield and the total return are two different things. The yield is what's kicking out in regards to income. Um, and the total return is going to be the growth of the overall index fund. So you bought it at $100 this year. It could kick out a 1.5% yield, but it could also grow to $200 a share in a year. So your total return is going to be a lot higher than the 1.74% yield that it's kicking out, depending on what companies issue the dividends. So you have to look at the total return. Going back to the dividend question once again, if a stock issues a dividend, it's not going to go to zero because, well, I guess if it doesn't grow, right? I mean, you, you have a hundred dollars share price and it never grows in a vacuum and you give it a dollar dividend, now your share price is $99. If it doesn't continue to grow and you give another dividend, it's going to go to $98. So after 100 years, could theoretically go to zero? Yes, but they wouldn't issue dividends if, <laughs> if the stock price was that low. They didn't have the cash to do it. Yeah, typically a dividend comes when the company has profits. If there's no profits, usually they wouldn't issue a dividend. So you can't really get the zero. And that, that yield, that's right, Joe, yield is an annual. It's not a quarterly amount. It's an annual yield. And that's only part of the equation. The growth is the other part to get to the total return. So he's also asking many websites state that BTSAX in the ETF equivalent BTI, uh, despite some differences, should actually perform equally uh, since they both track the same companies. Absolutely correct. Don't get too caught up in the weeds here, Bruce. Um, one's an exchange traded fund, one's an index fund. One is, you know, traded a little bit differently. One has a little bit better transparency. One can be traded on the stock market while the other one closes. You buy it at the end of the, I mean, they're almost identical. So I'm not going to get too caught up there. You can buy either one of them. Who who cares? Um, 
just trying to figure it out, making an apples to apples choice with the total market index fund versus high yield stocks. Okay, now he's getting crazy here. What do you think about these high yield stocks? What are, I don't even know what high yield stocks means, Bruce. And I don't know where he's. He's got them earning 6% every quarter. That would be some investment, just the <laughs> Bruce, yield part. Put your money on the high yield stocks. <laughs> uh, I'd like to know what does that. I mean, it, I mean, that would be one of the best investments of all time. If you could get 6% <laughs> per quarter, every quarter for the rest of your life. And then growth on top of that? Yeah, it was perfect. Oh, that'd, be, that'd be cool. Um, so Mr. Buffett holds them. So you got to give me a little bit more information there. But just understand that the, the higher expected return, the more risk that you're taking. I like your total stock market index or your, your ETF choice. Um, I think that's right on. You're fully diversified, very low cost. Uh, the only issues that I potentially see, depending on how much money that you have, is that you want to diversify out because that's just the total U.S. markets. Um, the more money that you get, you can get better diversification within the U.S. markets by um, maybe overweighting or underweighting certain sectors, maybe certain asset classes. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you have international emerging markets in there. Um, as you get older, you know, then you want a little bit more fixed income, safety in the portfolio. So uh, lastly, for a 13-year-old, is UTMA, Uniform Transfer to Miners Act, or opening a brokerage account the best thing until they start working and open up their own Roth? Uh, any one of those can affect the financial aid application for FASA, right? Thanks, guys. Still the best. I would just go with a brokerage account. You get a little bit more flexibility. It's in your name. The UTMA account will be in the kid's name. Um, and then you could transfer, you could gift the brokerage account into the Roth once the kid gets its money. Uh, there's not huge tax benefits anymore from Utmar Ugmas, in my opinion. Uh, let's go to Josh from North Carolina. Hi, Andy, Joe, and Big Al. Love listening to the podcast each week while driving to work in my Tacoma. Yeah, here in beautiful North Carolina. I have no dog, but a cat, maybe a little bit more Big Al speed cat huh? yeah big al has like eight cats you're a cat person al <laughs> i've never owned a cat no. <laughs> you look like a cat guy do, do I, I, I was on a it. webinar earlier today and this lady looked like she probably had 10 cats yep. um, i have a question um about some advice paul merriman gives on his blog he says if you put three thousand dollars into a taxable account at your child's birth and invest the money in a small cap value index fund once they have taxable income, you contribute this money into their Roth IRA. After 65 years, if you get 12% rate of return, it'll be worth $5 million. I guess this can be taken out tax-free at this point. However, it only is about a million dollars in today's money after inflation is taken into account. Is this a reasonable way to take a relatively small amount of money and create a reasonable gift for a child at retirement? Or does this math not quite work out? Thanks for all your help. Um, Josh, yeah, I'm, I don't have a calculator in front of me. Maybe Big Al can do the calculation in a couple of minutes. Yeah, here, but... I already did it, Joe. So uh, the answer is the math does work with these assumptions. So 65 years, $3,000 one time at 12% uh, at age 65 is $4.7 million. So yeah. it, it actually does work. It's actually a great idea. So yeah, if you want to give a gift uh, that keeps giving 65 years in the future, um, who knows? Now, I mean, now he's he's referencing, um, let's see, small cap. Yeah, it's funds. A small cap value, 12. Small cap value. Yeah, and that's historically what it's done over the last century. So will it do that the next century? I don't know, but no. <laughs> that's that's what it has done. Right. If you got an investment that does 12 percent, that's the, the the math works. Yep. Um, give it a shot. Hopefully you're alive in 65 years to see if it came true. A couple comments. Uh, Marion from Fresno wrote in um, on podcast 290, we referenced 529 plans. I've heard the Utah 529 plan is great because they use DFA funds. Well, there you go. Let's promote the Utah 529 plan. <laughs> So a, a 529 plan is money that you put in for education. It often, you, you'd like to put it in when, you're, when your child is young to let it grow. It grows tax deferred, and if the money is used for education, it's actually tax-free. So that's the advantage. You can pick whatever state that you want to 
to, to choose. Each state has their own investments. Utah apparently has DFA, Dimensional Fund Advisors, which I agree is it's a great fund company. And it's, it's a fund company, Joe, that to the typical investor doesn't have access to because it's institutional. So here's a way to invest in DFA funds and, and not have to go through an investment advisor. I uh, want to congratulate David T., um, the, our big winner for our survey this year. Uh, thank you all for participating into the survey. It gives us some good feedback and insight on what you want to hear, what we should do, what we should stop doing. Um, actually, we don't really take anything into account. Andy collects the information, and, um, and that's about it. And she tells I, I, us that we have to change the show. And we're like, no, we're not going to do it. This came up many times, though, in that uh, that survey. Joe, what kind of car do you drive? Um, what kind of car do I drive? Yeah. Well, we are congratulating David T. Here. <laughs> um, All right, we'll, we'll get back to that. You he doesn't want to talk about the big engine on Big Joe. <laughs> and, and five, <laughs> that big giant car that you have, that big <laughs> black car. It's not a giant car. It's a very reasonable price. Um, <laughs> Land Rover. Yeah, Land Rover, right? It's one that takes two parking places. All righty. That's it for us. Thanks again. Uh, we'll uh, take a, well, I guess we're done for the show. We'll see you guys next week. Show's done your money well. In the podcast show notes, you'll find free financial resources on Roth IRA conversions, investing, and college savings. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to get there. And stick around for a few derails coming up shortly. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 for your free financial assessment. That's 888 888- 9946257 Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. All right, who's got beeping going on? Is that you, Al? Probably. Is there something backing up there? It sounds like there's construction going on. I can just yeah, barely the, hear it in the background. It's no big deal. Always someone doing something, something here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, Deborah, no, my God, I almost read Deborah from California. Again. Uh, email again. <laughs> um, first of all, Rudy, we'd like to know where the hell you're from, what you drive, and if you're a cat or dog person. Because <laughs> Big Al will answer it if you're a cat person. I will oh, not answer now I'm a cat person. Yeah, you're. Well, I gotta set. I gotta set the record straight. You sure. keep talking about my big wallet, and now on our podcast survey, everyone thinks I got loads of money. What well, do you do? And the, the only reason I don't refute that is, is, is I've learned by refuting something, it makes it ten times worse, and you keep bringing it up. Hey, you're talking to the stalker here. I get called the stalker <laughs> all the time. Yeah, and for that exact same reason. Yeah, so you just let it go. True yep. statement. Then, both both yeah. are very true statements. And what's the true <laughs> statement about you, Joe? What? That I am uh, just a, a fun, go lucky. <laughs> uh, well, going back to your big wallet now. <laughs> yeah. Is because, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many years ago, this was, uh, um, we were doing that big tax workshop. <laughs> And then we were doing trivia to give away books or something like that, right? Yeah. And then I, then I asked the audience, I said, you know, hey, why do they call, why do we call Big Al Big Al? Something like that, right? And then someone in the audience yells, you know, I don't know, ask his wife. And the whole place erupts with laughter. All right. And then so, and it, it was funny, you know, the guy got a book. And so the next year, so Al opens the thing up, he, like he's telling his own joke and he can't give that punchline without sounding like a complete pervert. Yeah, and I learned that. Thank you yes. for reminding me again of one of my failures on stage. So it was like, he said, hey, why do you call me Big Al? I'll ask well, my wife. Ask my wife. I remember like three or four women were horrified. I heard gasps. Oh my go, God, oh, it that was crickets. It was that, crickets. That, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so then I said, Joe, you want to take over? People wrote in <laughs> their evaluation. I cannot, I'm appalled. <laughs> so 
See, my attempt at stand-up, uh, I'm, I know I'm not a stand-up comedian, so I'll no. just let that go. Yeah, there, there, there you have it, folks. Yeah. Okay. I think that was uh, that was Hank, right, that said ask it, it his It was. Wife. It was. Yeah. yeah. He worked with your dad, right? Yep, he did. Pastry shop. Well, look at Chris. That would be, maybe you should send us, like, some donuts or something. But you can right? eat those, Joe. I know I don't eat them, but there's a lot of people here that eat a lot of stuff that you would not believe. You throw some pastry in the kitchen, it'd be like ants, you know, on a, a French fry in the middle of summer in Minnesota. It, it wouldn't last. In fact, things like that get put in the lunchroom and then Catherine will announce them, but they're already gone before she writes the email. Pastry shop. What, what is a pastry? What, what else do they need? Pastry. I mean, I don't even know really what pastries are. Is that like cakes, pies, awesome. donuts? Yeah, cupcakes. Croissants? Cupcakes. Yeah, yeah, whatever. 